Welcome to Lift Your Legacy. My name is Jacob Rupp, father, husband, and rabbi. And each week we bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unlock your inner potential and create change that will impact the future. Thank you for listening and let's get to it. I am thrilled to have on today Rabbi Jacobs and Rabbi Lynn, two very influential people in the Jewish world and some people who have really been involved in marriage and coaching for marriage and helping people understand marriage. They've recently written, it's not that recent actually, I remember reading it about a year ago, but I think I tried to rush, rush it off the presses because I was very excited when I saw the project that you guys had. So it's very exciting for me to be able to actually interview you. The book is, it's actually, you should know, on my very short list, people say, well, I have this long book list. My marriage list is very, very short. And uh, so I appreciate you giving me a resource of a, of a book that's been, since I've read it, on my list of, you know, things people should read. And it's exciting because we definitely come from a Jewish background and you bring in a lot of Jewish principles, but it's really completely accessible. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to be Jewish. It's just good advice. So I'd like to thank you very much and maybe tell me a little bit what motivated you? Why did you feel it was so important? Again, you go by Todd and Peter on the front of the book. You know, there's, we're really not, we're not, we're not waving the, the, the Jewish flag very widely. So tell me about that process for you. Sure. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll jump in here. Uh, so we, we run together. We, Rabbi Lynn and I have worked together for 15 years in a small sort of boutique yeshiva for guys with very strong secular and professional backgrounds in their 20s into their 30s who want to spend one year to two years immersively studying traditional Jewish sources. So our typical student is super, you know, super, um, you know, successful in their career. They've gone to good colleges. They've gone to graduate school in many cases. They are, you know, tops of their careers or on the way to the tops of careers in finance and in consulting and law and social work and acting and, you know, kind of the, the, the gamut. And one thing they tend to share that we discovered more and more, and that is as successful and prepared as they are for everything in their professional lives, they are almost equally unprepared for the part of life which they say is the most important, which is their marital life that they dream of. And, you know, the more research we did, some of it, again, through our living laboratory, working with our students, and some of it with actually, you know, research that Peter, you know, the Rabbi, Lin, even I call him Peter, by the way, because of, the, because of our stage presence with this book, Rabbi Lynn, Rabbi Yosef Lynn, that um, a lot of the work that, that he has done and research he's done has shown that, that actually marriage is something that almost everybody in our society, from religious to totally non-religious, dreams of as being, you know, that centerpiece of their life someday. And yet, when you look at the statistics, people are woefully inadequate. And we have even found that our students who are kind of best and brightest were really unprepared. And then after 15 years of doing marital education that both of, our, both of us are very involved in, we pulled our heads up and we said, wow, our guys have a divorce rate that's about one-tenth of the U.S. average. So it must be that you can really make a difference by doing education, coaching, best practices, things like that some of which is, you know, kind of great psychological insight that Rabbi Lynn brings to it, and, as well as rabbinical insight. And then, you know, and, and I brought some real world insight into it and some Kabbalistic, you know, pieces and things like that. Somehow by pulling it all together, you can help people succeed in marriage much more successfully. And we said, wow, this is, that's really something. We spoke it over with a lot of people and some very, very significant rabbis, like world famous rabbis, at, you, know, in the, you know, in the world of yeshivas even, said, you really should bring this, if you can write it in a way that will appeal to a secular audience, that's a mitzvah to go out and make marriage better for everybody. It's make marriage better for non-Jews, make marriage better for non-religious Jews, make marriage better for anybody. And so we did our, our best to take deep, truthful concepts, not pollute them, even though we tried to make them accessible, um, not distort them. And we put it out in this book. So it's a bit of a long answer to your question, but that's kind of, and we used our English names. You know, I had a, I had a background on Wall Street and uh, Rabbi Lynn has a background in sports and architecture and psychology. And so we said, you know, it's not fake. We're not, we're not faking anything. It's just part of who we are under a different name, essentially. So we decided to use our, our regular secular names that we grew up with uh, I instead, of, to... instead of rabbi. 
I wanted to ask, first of all, I appreciate Rabbi Lynn. It's, it's very funny that um, you have, I'm looking at the books behind you. I, I, I have all of my workbooks over here. It's the same kind of a concept. Like, I promise I read Jewish books. It's just downstairs. So I, I, it's very exciting to see that. I think that the two pieces that I would hopefully be able to get some of your, your thoughts on, step number one is I think there's a certain, call it because of social media, call it because of the stigma that exists around Orthodox Jews, religious people in general, that we don't right away look at divorce as a, you know, as the, the next logical alternative when things aren't working. Um, I think it's not just that we want, again, that, that 10% number is a very, you know, 10% of the population, however we said it, there's 10% less likely um, getting divorced, right? But it's not just that. I think there's a certain principle that we're trying to make marriage thrive, not just sort of stay together. And so perhaps we could start there with a, with an expectation that, or how do you build that expectation that you really could build a marriage into something that's deeply, fulfill deeply fulfilling, not just stable and comfortable and just we're together for a practical reason? So I think like this, I think that um, one of the problems we find is like this. We find that, you know, there's no one that stands under the chuppah and doesn't want an amazing marriage of bliss, of eternity, of, you know, everyone wants that. I don't care whether you're Jewish, non-Jew, it doesn't matter what race or religion you are. There's no one that goes to their wedding and says, I hope it works out. I hope it's a, you know, a C plus average and we're good to go. So the problem that we found though, is that people have no idea that, okay, I want to have this amazing world of marriage, which is this, my best friend in this life together and it only gets better with time. But, you know, Everything in our life, it's our professional life. If I want to be a certain person, you know, I was in school for architecture, you have to go through a whole world of training to become an architect. So what happens is it gets to this world of marriage and we all have this ideal that we want and people just don't understand, okay, what has to happen in order for me to get there? And then what happens is there's this wild idea, which uh, again, you know, where it comes from, we can debate that, but People live with the assumption that, well, if now there are issues that come up in the marriage, well, I guess what? It wasn't meant to be. Because the assumption, if this was the person, it would be, you know, perfect forever. So, so what, what, you know, just going back to why we wrote this book, we just found that, you know, people asked us, they said, why do you need another marriage book out there? There's lots of great, I have on my bookshelf over here, tons of great marriage books out there, Jewish, non-Jewish, you name it. So in our, if, if our book was a college class, it would really be a prerequisite for all other marriage classes because what our book deals with is two fundamental questions. Number one, let's define what a marriage is. I mean, let's know what we're getting ourselves into. And number two, what's the PDF manual for our marriage? And we deal with these two kind of fundamental questions that when people really get that clear, we find it makes all the world of difference. So I think that, you know, people want great marriages. We've never met a couple that we've worked with that just wants mediocre. But unfortunately, there are just so many misconceptions that are out there as far as how to get there. And that's a real problem. Not just misconceptions, how to get there, but it sounds like also if the foundation of what you felt was necessary to do was to define what marriage is and what it looks like, it seems like it's not just how do we get there, but what is it in general? So perhaps you could speak a little bit about that, where or what you think the primary distortions that people have. Again, we live in a very, you know, there's so much out there. And it's not just like you look at your parents, you look at the people down the street and you look at your grandparents and then you sort of have an expectation. It's like you have a billion different options and nothing is taken for granted anymore. How do we, or why do you think there's a value to trying to articulate what a universal definition of marriage might be? And again, to say, it, it, it also to define it, like even, we're not even saying like defining what genders we're talking about. We're talking about what this relationship actually is. So it's an even more profound sort of a definition. So why do that? And how is there kind of like one universal definition? Uh, it, that's, a very, that's a very powerful question. And I think there are a few parts to it. Um, first of all, as, as Rabbi Lynn was mentioning before, we have very good training for everything we take seriously in life besides marriage. 
Secondly, I think we also have very well-defined ideals in front of us. If, I, if I'm going to be a lawyer or a social worker or an actor, if I want to be a great actor, I got Brad Pitt in front of me. If I want to be a great social worker, I have Dr. Whoever. And if I want to be a great, you know, Wall Street analyst, I've got somebody else in front of me. And, and I, can, I, can, I can see it. I get reviewed on the way there by clients, by bosses, by colleagues, by how much they pay me, by whether I keep my job. There's a constant learning cycle. And, and it's a vision that I'm moving towards, which is understandable and definable. In marriage, it's like the exact opposite. And especially now, see, you know, if, if, if we were talking, I'm probably older than everyone here, but if we look, you know, if I talk to my parents about what their parents' generation was like, it's not clear that my grandparents who, you know, arrived in, a, in the U.S. in, you know, at the turn of the century, it's not cl- the turn of the last century, that is the, the 1900s, not, the, uh, not 20 years ago. It was pretty good otherwise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but they, I don't know that they had a sparkling marriage. Um, but they had a committed, mature marriage, a set of values, principles they lived by. And through that process, they built something together. And, and they gave security to each other. And they gave love to each other. And they left a legacy for themselves. By the way, in my family, nobody was religious. So you don't have to, you know, it's not like there's any monopoly on religiosity to make that happen. But what's happened over the last, you know, 50 years, 60 years, is that, is that almost nobody gets to see a role model of a really thriving marriage. Um, if you're one of the 50% whose marriages last, you, and you referred to this actually in your last question, but the fact that you are one of the 50% who stays married doesn't mean you have a great marriage. It could, as, as, as you both said, it could be a C plus and it could be a, a D minus, but you just, you know, whatever, we stay together because of the kids or finances or social, whatever it is. COVID. And, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you're, you're not my soulmate. You're my cellmate. Yeah. From now on. But, uh, but the, but the, the point is, is that the point is, is that you can have something bigger, but if you don't know what it looks like and you can't define it, it's like having a GPS and saying, I'm going to get there, but I haven't yet put a destination. In. And I don't, you know, the GPS can't help you. So we went back to an incredible source, which is the, you know, the description of the creation of Adam and Eve. And, you know, there's kind of a Kabbalistic reality story there, which can be told to the most secular person. And it's such an inspiring story. And it goes as follows. Can I, can I take one minute and just, you know, if you, if you look at how, how Adam, which is Adam, which is a word that just doesn't mean man, it means human being. It wasn't somebody's name Adam. It just means human. And, and the first human being was created according to the Gemara, Kabbalistic sources, a male female entity, which was then split apart and then given a commandment to go and find each other and come back together and become one flesh and become one. It's the most, if you think about that on the face of it, it's a terribly bizarre story. If we're meant to be one, why are we split? If we're meant to be two, why did we come out as one in the first place? Like what, what, why one to two to one? What is that? But the answer is so profound. And the answer is that because we were one, and now Adam, meaning Adam and Eve, which are archetypes for all human beings and which we all resonate to, if a person believes even a little bit that we have some soul, then we all resonate to that original soul. And Adam and Eve were a single unity, which, and, and because they were a single unity, it means they have the possibility of being a single unity. Without that, without that ringing, that, that eternal ringing of being a single unity, of being a unified entity, they can never do that. On the other hand, because they were, because, unless they were split apart and became two, they would never be able to freely choose to come together and to give to each other and to commit to each other. If they were one, and by the way, according to some of the traditional sources, not only were they one, they could procreate. There was no, meaning there was really no physical, technical reason that they needed to be split and come back together. They were fine as they were. The world could have gone on. But what was missing was the ability for two human beings to refine themselves through giving to each other, getting out of themselves, committing to the other, building something bigger than the self. And, and, and in that process, coming back to something resonating in their souls as something that they're longing for, which is that original oneness. So it's the most incredible 
Now, that's a very different vision than you look up and you look up in Webster's, what's a marriage? It says two people who are legally you know, bound to each other. Uh, it's a very different, that, that's not a very inspiring vision of what I'm going for. It's going to transform my life. But the vision that my, my spouse and I are, we're eternally one. We were, we, we were one, the, the, you know, the oneness that we have goes back forever. And that, that can be reattained if we can just give to each other and commit to each other and create that, that bigger picture of ourselves that we can do together. That, that's, that begins to paint a picture of something which is, whoa, that's, that's, that's something if I can get that clear, it can help me understand what my role is and, 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 how, and what my job is and what my responsibility is. And without that picture, it's very hard to get there. So what, what I'm hearing you say is that the fundamental underpinning of sort of where we get lost nowadays in marriage is that so often we're busy trying to figure out, does this work for me? And, I, you know, and, that's, and that's reflected across all of the different industries, you know, and it's even, even in terms of making religion relevant to people, again, we're trying to figure out, well, how does this work for you? And in terms of work, it's, you know, like, well, I'm never going to commit to a job at a company for a long term. Like you'll have LinkedIn will say, yeah, work for us for a little bit and then bounce somewhere else, then come back. And so as long as a person's in their head thinking, is this working for me right now? Fundamentally, you've, shift at, you've shifted out of that paradigm of what biblical marriage or what marriage is supposed to be and moved into a place where it's sort of just a a time ticking time bomb down to it's no longer going to work because it's never going to last for you forever. Is that sort of what I'm hearing? Yeah. And, and, if, and, and the extent to which I think about myself first, and it's really just about me, that's the extent to which, again, <laughs> it's very, very hard to be a great spouse if I'm not, again, you know, one of, one of the things we try to put into our sort of working definition of marriage and, and Rabbi Lynn really, formulated it himself. Well, actually, I think, I think actually Rabbi Lynn should say it because it's really kind of his formulation. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to steal a Sunday. Rabbi Lynn, like how, you know, why don't you give, give them the, the definition of marriage that we put in. Um, so the definition that we described of marriage is, 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 is the exact opposite of just what's good for me. And it's the total investment in the well-being of another person. And in many ways, regardless of what you get back. And when I look at marriage, is I am doing everything in my life to give my wife or give my spouse what she wants, what she needs, what she yearns for. And she's doing that for me as well. You have a magic there, which is unstoppable. And now all of a sudden, that's the working definition of what a marriage is. If I'm looking at it, you know, the book is called Not a Partnership. And people ask like, okay, most partnerships in the world, and Rabbi Jacobs has done a lot of research in this, fail. They don't work out. And because a partnership is very much, you know, tit for tat. Well, here's what I've done. Well, what have you done? And hey, you know, I worked extra hard this week. Have you worked extra hard this week? And partnerships are based on, you know, this idea of this constant back and forth of measuring what the other person has done. Is the other person putting in enough? Are they not putting in enough? And the reality is marriage is probably, you know, this may sound funny, is the greatest partnership in the world. But it's got to have the right definition of what this new partnership actually is. Can, can I just stop you on that? Because I, 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 with your background in psychology and obviously the many decades of work that you've done on yourself and with, with other people, perhaps one of the things that comes up a lot of times is, this works really well if like we were raised like this, or this works really well, even in a case of two people decide to commit to, let's say more, you know, a rigorous religious lifestyle, and then we get married based on these premises. But for people that are out there and the relationship didn't really start like that, and maybe they've been married for 20 years, 30 years, you know, maybe the kids are out of the house already, and now they're sort of looking at each other and, you know, the initial utility of let's get married, let's build a house, let's have kids. And now they're kind of like looking at each other in the quiet of, you know, uh, of their lives. How do you shift it back? How do you bring that conversation back? How do you reframe, so to speak, and rewrite the rules of partnership? I mean, that's, that's where so much uh, opportunity for lawyers comes in. It's like, well, no one, you know, it's like, you can't change the relationship once we, once we start. So like, how do you what, what are some tools or tips that you've seen that have worked for the people that you've been involved with where there is this sort of like lack of clarity around the nature of the partnership or the nature of the relationship? How do you bring it back to a place where we're both going to radically commit to being for each other? So I'll tell you, um, the most important thing is to find out first how much they actually want to make that happen. And 
if I have a couple in front of me that even though things may have started off in the wrong way for, and, and, and they kind of been going in the wrong direction for a long period of time, but they really come with a real desire to say, you know what, I want to make a change. We don't want things to go like this. We see where things are headed, you know, especially once the kids leave and they really have a desire to change. When you have people who have a real desire to change, I have seen so many things can actually happen. If there's not a real desire to change and it's basically a lot of lip service and let's go through the motions. So I know I'll call the lawyer myself and uh, we can end this thing, you know, quite soon, but if there's a real desire to change. It, it, it's amazing that, you know, when we, when we want things in life, we make things happen. And, you know, we have dealt with couples that have come to us where they really want to make a change. And by, you know, spending time in therapy, by spending time in the world of marriage education, meaning forget therapy, let's just give me an example of what a good marriage actually looks like. We've seen that people can make really drastic changes in their relationship, but if there's no desire there and it's just kind of lip service and people are looking for short-term solutions. You're hundred percent right. I think that it's a, a, a very difficult reality to try and tap into. Well, let me push, let me push back on, on that a little bit, because especially in our circles, like having a family and the stability of the family is like very paramount. So it's like, we, we deal all the time with ourselves and with people that we're involved with, they get married. And it's not like they just hang out for 10 years and figure out if it works. It's like, there's usually kids there relatively early and not usually a few of them, you know, you have a bunch of kids. And so I find oftentimes that the, the difficulty is that what you're suggesting, having a real conversation saying, do you really want to change? And, and asking your spouse, do you really want to change? A lot of times that's a really scary question because if the answer bounces back at no, so then like, what do we do? So how do we, how do we essentially as, as just kind of the, the, the listeners of the shows are, are usually parents that are already many kids in and, you know, many, many years in, um, how do we kind of put our security and put the security of our family up to ask such a difficult and potentially scary and divisive question. Would you advise that? And how do you do it? Look, I, I, I think that, you know, depending on the audience you're speaking to, there can be very different sets of um, premises built in. So as you said, for example, if you're talking to secular people, um, um, secular with values, but just called secular, not, not you know, where, where the, you know, kind of Jewish communal structure is not part of their life. Um, so, so for them, you know, the, the idea of divorce is, first of all, there's much less stigma associated with it. They have fewer kids. It's going to be less, you know, trauma for everybody. Um, and so sometimes people just kind of grow apart and there, there happens to be a whole wave of divorces, which hit when people become empty nesters. Um, which I got obviously with secular people with fewer kids happens earlier. And, you know, um, I think, I think when you're talking to people who really have a, a deeper um, desire for marriage, because a, they were raised with the concept that it's sacrosanct B they were B, B they want to keep it together for the family so that they have grandchildren who could come to the grandparents and, you know, and the whole, you know, the whole progeny issue. And I think also because of social stigma, it's much harder, frankly, to be a single person, you know, in an orthodox society, in the sense the more orthodox it is, the more difficult it is. So I think, I think the, you're in a sense, probably the conversation is not going to be, hey, do you think marriage is important? I think it's got to be, what can we do to jumpstart our marriage, which seems to be losing its sizzle or maybe lost its sizzle a long time ago? And you know, one of the one of the things. Look, I, I came from a background. I came from a very secular background, um, without any religious training, until I was 23 years old. And one of the things that really blew me away when I when I just started getting exposed to the Orthodox world in on the Upper West Side of Manhattan was how sparkling some older, much older people were, seemingly just to the outside observer at the Shabbos table with their kids in their marriages, like how special it seemed, how, how they treated with each other with respect and how much humor there was and how much warmth there was and things like that. And you saw it obviously reflected in the children and everything else. And, and I think that um, what people can do is rather than have a conversation saying, hey, is marriage important? Of course it's important. Of course we want to keep it together. The question is, what, how do we, as two people, two mature people, what do we do? That's where the whole second half of our book comes in. 
we have five sections in that. We have four, excuse me, four, four pillars in that, in that, which you may be, are- You may be nervous like I missed one yeah, of them. Yeah, I was like, oh, five? <laughs> we have four pillars in there of how to basically breathe life back into your marriage or create it with life. And it is never too late to, to start working on how you speak to your spouse, what kind of respect you show your spouse. It's never too late to begin doing things to freshen up your marriage. And it can be as simple as like bringing in more small vacations, what we call mini vacations, which are rather than the big Hail Mary, which that's really not a Jewish kind, but the, the concept of the, you know, the, the, the once a year, you know, winner take all, you know, vacation, we're going to take three weeks in Hawaii, which is usually disastrous because it never works out. You know, and you spend all your money and you come back exhausted. And but that was just you. I just no, me. No, 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 it never works out. But what always works out is if you're always, we, we discover through research that the happiest times of vacation are the planning stages of vacation. The two of you with the, sitting in, in front of the internet, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? And how can we do this? And how can we do that? So you should, A, always be planning a, a, a vacation. This seems like a trivial thing, by the way. But two people who are always excited about the next step that they're going to take together, even if that next step is a mini vacation, which is to say not a three-week vacation in Hawaii, but, 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 uh, uh, but getting babysitters and going away one night in the city together or for a weekend together or for, you know, and doing that more frequently, it has an inc- that actually has an ability to breathe freshness into a marriage. That's just one little example. And we, and we tried to find as many um, examples of things people could do that were practical that would in four different arenas be able to kind of all move. And by the way, the common denominator of all of these things is there's always a component of giving to each other. But if you just tell people, well, just give to each other, that, that's not very useful. You have to break it down into components. And that's what we, that's what we try to do. But I, I would tell somebody, as long as they have not just damaged each other beyond repair, and sometimes they have, um, and sometimes there is no love and sometimes all the reserves are gone and there's no goodwill. And, you know, there are, there are marriages which where we would, we would agree with the people, you know, you, you tried, you gave, it's, you know, can't, it, it's not going to work. But most people we found actually, even with one person taking responsibility can actually make it happen and can change the, it can be a sea change. And, and it takes time to turn that boat sometimes, but it can get really, you know, it can really be a huge difference down the line. So that piece about, I'm sorry, Rabbi, go ahead. Just, just to add on one thing here is that, you know, you mentioned like, you know, sometimes it may be scary for couples to actually have this conversation. It's actually a little bit of a catch 22 because the reality is you have a lot of these couples who are staying together for the sake of their families. But we all know if you go to any, you know, seminar on the world of education or you read any book on raising children, hopefully every opening chapter is going to say the greatest thing you can give your children is for them to be, you know, a part of a loving marriage, for them to witness that. And the spillover from a loving marriage is going to be one of the greatest, you know, sources of security that children can get. So by not having that conversation, don't think that the home isn't being severely impacted by your lack of taking your marriage to the next step. So it's almost a a funny thing by just staying together for the sake of the family. Well, you're, you're, you're not necessarily giving your family the healthiest experience. Now, may it be healthier than actually divorce? Okay, it could be. Each case is different, but don't think that it's not impacting your family severely the state of where your marriage is. What, what, we, what we have seen so much is just the spillover from great, you know, Shalom bias is just so awesome. The amount of resilience it builds, the amount it takes away so many of the issues, the amount of joy it gives the kids, it, it's like totally unbelievable. So the question is really, how can you not have that conversation? And I think that, that, that that's, that's, a, that's a fascinating piece about being able to be honest with where things are, because we do try to check the box and say, well, you know, at least we're together. And you'll find out that the kids had, had, a, had a much worse time as a result of that. I, right. I'm curious to what extent, I, I think two things come out. One, one is, what are some tips that you have? Because at the end of the day, what you said, um, I think Rabbi Jacobs, you, you, had, you had said that even one person can take responsibility because always that what comes back is like, well, I'm, I'm into doing it, but what about him or her? And what are some tips that a person could take to really build? Cause it is a very scary thing where you need a lot of courage to really put yourself out there to be able to say, I'm going to take responsibility for the marriage. So what are some tips that you see that have made people successful in sort of asserting themselves and being strong enough themselves really to, 
to say the difficult things or to be honest with themselves or to be honest with their spouse. Sure. And, and by the way, this, this gets to the heart of the book. This gets to the not a partnership aspect, right? Of, you know, it, rather than looking at what you're doing, A, I have to start looking at what I bring to the table. Um, and I may be bringing a bad character trait to the table, which spills over into every part of my marriage. If it's anger, if it's selfishness, if it's lack of, I don't know, just a, a general lack of respect that I bring. Um, I, I, I have to realize that a that I can be a source of many problems. B, we have a whole chapter that is called "It All Depends on Me," and that's a mindset which is very. This is a very anti, you know, twenty twenty mindset. The twenty twenty mindset is if you're not good for me and you're not giving me what I need, then you know the heck with you, and you better change. And this is this is just flipping. It's just completely fl flipping the algorithm, and and. It's, listen, on, on the one hand, it's scary. On the other hand, people do know when you speak to them that if they're going to wait till their spouse changes, most of them know that the marriage will never get better. You know, may, you know I mean, it may take the husband a little longer to learn this than the wives. The, the wives tend to, in our circles, tend to be a little more emotionally uh, mature and tuned in and things like that. Um, I hope nobody finds that uh, anti-sexist or sexist or whatever, whatever, whatever politically incorrectness that would, that would be. But the point is that, is that when a person realizes that I can make a change, I can start something, I can put something into motion. Well, yeah, of course that means it's a little scary. On the other hand, it's very empowering. It's extremely empowering. If I told you, don't wait for the rest of your partners. You can go make a million dollars if you just start like, you know, I don't know, doing X in your company and, the co and it's going to pull the whole company up. You would say, I'm ready to do it. I don't need to wait for him, right? Even though he's my partner, I hope it's going to be great. I, you wouldn't do it that way. In marriage, it's extremely empowering. And we have seen close up some really amazing flowering changes in some relationships where one side says, I cannot wait for my spouse to do this. They're not, it's not going to happen. They're too tuned out and they're too beaten up and they're too cynical and they're too whatever else it is. Very rarely when one person starts really trying, does the other person not, you'd have to be a very broken, very broken person to be the other person not to respond when you see that your spouse, now again, usually there'll be a little bit of distrust in the beginning, You're trying to manipulate me. What do you want from me? You're trying to get something. Why are you being so nice to me? But when the person says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this happen. I'm going to try and jumpstart our marriage. I'm going to try and make this happen. And the way I'm going to start doing it is I'm, whatever it is, I'm going to start being nicer. I'm going to start doing this for you. I'm going to start doing that for you. I'm going to start being more respectful the way I speak to you. It's almost impossible for, for, for anybody who has a little bit of health and a little bit of heart left in them to not respond to that. And so what's really amazing is that I, I'm, I'm an investor at heart. And what an investor loves is that you put in one and you get back two. And that tends to be what happens in these scenarios. One person absolutely has to make that first investment, but usually what they find is that they get paid back in spades. And I, it's not a reason to do, it's not, you don't do this to be cynically, I'm gonna manipulate them so I get more back. It just happens to be that it's a virtuous cycle. And that's what happens. It's a virtuous cycle that, build, that begins building. And then the other person does more for you. And now, wow, I, now, wow, I didn't even believe you would respond. And now you're responding to me, oh my gosh, I'm going to do even more. And we've seen it. We've seen it close up and it can happen. And the, sooner you, and the sooner you get to it, the better. Amazing. I've, I've two more, I, could go, I could go for many hours. I have two more questions because I, I feel like, uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to say. One of the things that you mentioned about the people that you work with and certainly that you're aware of is that for people that are bringing in, let's say, working a lot in their careers. Their careers are important to them. They're able to, you know, thank God in a lot of cases, make a lot of money and provide a very nice lifestyle. One of the fascinating things that we've seen is sometimes we, we or our spouses might deliver something that the other spouse didn't look for. And I know that that's a very age old problem, but how do we work around that idea that I could slave away, so to speak, in an office, make billions of dollars, build this perfect mansion, and then have my spouse say, I didn't want any of that stuff. So how does one essentially, and, and unfortunately it might be, it, it doesn't, for some, it doesn't take overnight to, to build a mansion and to make millions of dollars. So it's like, this is a major investment of my life only to find out that my ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. So how does a person kind of stay present with the relationship to see if 
I am actually giving over the part that you actually married me for. I'm really barking up a wrong tree. So I, I think that, that one of the things that's important is that when you get married, you know, you are in it together. And we have to realize, you know, let's say I'll take myself, any decisions that I'm making are impacting my wife. And what happens a lot of times is, well, this is what I want to do. This is good for me. This is the dream I had. Like that conversation doesn't exist anymore once you get married. And in a healthy marriage, what's always happening is that the couples are speaking together and they're discussing, is this good for the marriage? You know, let's say you're taking a person who's going to now go start his hedge fund. If he doesn't have his wife's buy-in as far as what that life is going to look like, what the sacrifice are going to be, what it could lead to, and what it may not lead to, if they're not on the same page, that's going to be a force of destruction. That conversation's got to happen before the hedge fund is launched. And these, you know, and that's why it's so important that when you realize that it's not just about what I'm doing in my life and then my spouse is doing something else, everything we're doing, we are doing something together because our actions impact each other. So when you have couples that are talking nonstop, it's, it, it's an unbelievable thing. And along the way, they're speaking about the ramifications, they're checking in nonstop. The problem is when the conversations never happen, and now 10 years down the line, you finally have you know, some deep insights together. Hello, it, it's, it's it, you know, everything crumbles, and everything falls apart, where if the communication was just better along the way, you would never be at this point. Can, can I, can I throw, just add a couple of comments on that? Um, one may be a paradigm shift and the other a piece of advice. Um, I worked on Wall Street and I worked in a echelon of Wall Street that was rarefied. And what I saw were, in a sense, two different types of people who got to that space. One type, basically, the whole universe became about them. And by the way, when the whole universe is about you, you're not much fun when you come home. And first of all, your wife doesn't like write about you like the New York Times writes about you. And your wife doesn't like go like this when you walk in. So by the way, so, some husbands get so, e I mean, some, again, this, I think this is more of a male problem. They get so ego driven by the, kind of what's going on in their professional life that they get, they just can't, they don't even like going home anymore. It's much better to, I mean, in the secular world, right, find, better go find a girlfriend or, you know, like who will, the adulation will continue. So first of all, the, 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 that idea of like, I just, it's all about me and it's all about my career, it's all about my ego, that, that is a, a, an absolute guaranteed destroyer. I have seen people who even don't reach that, who can still wreck their marriages. And the way that they can do it is simply the wife begins to really feel, I'm, again, I'm talking a class case where the husband, it, could be, it can work the other way as well, by the way. But, but let's take the classic case where the wife begins to feel that you really actually are more into your business and more into making money than you're into me. And there are very subtle ways that that gets communicated to her. For example, when he fight again, most wives, if, if, if I had a job was very demanding, my wife understood I pay 30% of the time, 35% of the time. And when earnings comes and I'm, and I'm you know, and, and as an analyst, I have to deal with the earnings. I'm, I'm working till two o'clock in the morning every three months for two weeks, whatever, whatever that number was. But the question is, what happens when I'm done with that work? Do I then tell her I want to go out with my buddies and go get a drink? Do I want to go play tennis with my friend? Do I want to go to, or do I run home and make sure that we now have time together? Because yes, we, we've sacrificed it, that, that this is the job I've taken because we've agreed that this is what we're going to do because we need whatever we need from this. But when, as soon as that's over, do I make you the center of my concern, the center of my life? If the answer is no, then, then she really has good reason to believe that she is now really definitely third fiddle, okay? Not even second fiddle. And I think that the, the, the paradigm shift, I think, that can help this is, it was brought home to me. Um, we have, we, we have in, the, in, the, uh, in the yeshiva a very famous rabbi who teaches there, and, and uh, may, I don't know if he wants me to say his name or not, so I won't, but very famous rabbi who is one of the world's great advice givers um, in the world of marriage and in the world of, of, of child raising and relationships and all kinds of things. And, and, this might, and this might be a little closer to home for some very religious people. Because, by the way, in the secular world and, and in many parts of the world, it's your profession. In the religious world, it can be your learning. Okay? So, so, so a young woman um, 
in about the third year of marriage with one or two kids, babies, and a husband who was learning in Coal Hill. Um, she was clearly, I, I was driving the rabbi home and she was having the conversation with him, right? And, uh, and this was the conversation I overheard, okay? This t- she said, I'm completely overwhelmed. I'm completely exhausted. My life is, you know, drudgery taking care, just trying to take care of the babies and everything. And she said, look, my husband, it's really important for him that he is learning. And this rabbi stopped her and he said, no, 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 no. He said, you got, you're working with the wrong paradigm. It's not important that you're, to him that he learns. It's important for you as a family at this stage that Tati is learning because that creates a different value structure for the family. It creates a different spirit for the family. Ruach, we would say, for the family. It creates a whole different, you as a young family, you're trying to create a certain type of household a Torah-centric household. And it's important in your world that, you're, that, that, that the two of you are investing in, we're going to have our father out, even in the, at night, even when it's difficult learning. He said, if it's about him and his needs versus your needs, why is his need more important than your need? He said, it has to be, what is our family going for? Which gets back to the original thing we said, which is that marriage is about what, what's, what do the two of you strive for that's bigger than either one of you? And the clearer that picture is, the more we can fit in our, our roles, our responsibilities in that greater picture. So, so of course, having Tati learning is, is paramount for our young family. On the other hand, if that's going to mean that mommy is falling apart, then that's not an optimization of our family life. So Tati is going to have to cut down a little bit or cut back a little bit for some period of time and, and, and be more helpful and, and whatever it is. But the point is, is that it's not me versus you. It's what are we striving for? And once that paradigm shift is about we and the family, it's much, much easier to resolve those types of disputes. Not me, my, what I want versus what you want. It's what we're trying to optimize. Thank you. So final, final question. What, what stuck out for me, which is very fascinating, you know, nowadays people are trying to, it's a, it's a funny world that, that we live in. You know, you find people have built empires uh, organizational empires off of like one idea. And Jews always kind of had the, the opposite was you have so many ideas and like you, you lose it because there's st- like every single line. And one of the things that, that popped out um, was that you both wrote this book and you don't want to build seminars. You don't want to build, you know, a, a coaching practices or license other people who are in the methodology of the not a partnership. You know, so as a result, like how does a person best take advantage? What is your vision for the future in terms of trying to throw a really wide net to really have a fundamental shift in terms of how the Americans, international people, like how everybody sees marriage with, with this book, what's the best way to take advantage of the information? Besides, of course, to read it and do it. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that what, you know, one of the ideas we speak about so much in the book is that great marriages are built. They don't just happen. And what we really hope is that if people read this book and at that point it launches inside of them, that they say, whoa, I've got work to do. So mission accomplished. Meaning you don't just, you don't just need our book. You need a whole team. You need, many, you, need, you know, in order to succeed in life, you need many things. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. You need a whole team of people. It may be for this couple, they need therapy. It may be this couple, they need seminars. Maybe they need both. Maybe... So what we really want to do is if this book can get out there into the hands of all races and all religions, and we can cast our net and it launches inside of a couple, a desire to say, let's get to work. I'll be the first to point them to 50 other great resources that are out there. We're not here to negate any of those resources. Many of them are very healthy. There are different approaches, different models, beautiful. So in our mind, real success is, you know, I don't want it to be, hey, read the book and then come to, you know, our duo seminar where we'll, you know, take you to the next level. There are people out there who could do it better than us and fantastic. We'll be the first to send you there. But if our book can launch inside people where that couple, let's say, you know, who's been married for 15 years and things have been okay and now the kids are getting older. If this book can now generate a conversation in that couple where they say, we still have a young marriage. Let's get our act together here you know, A plus as far as I'm concerned.
And I would just add to that, I think that if anything, what the book spurs people onto is a vision that giving is the key to all happiness and well-being. That selfishness leads to, ultimately leads to misery, depression, destroyed relationships. All of that spills over into bad children, different, I don't mean bad children, I mean children who have problems, you know, problems that I have helped create. Um, well-being spills over into your, your professional life. A person who's happy and feels that life is good has a lo much longer ability to function at work, much better with less stress, less anxiety. So the reality is that the, the, the cornerstone of the book is that you can change yourself and, and you can do so by getting a sort of a big picture of what it means to give and you can get it and you can get the small details in how to make that happen. And that can be transformational. That is the kind of thing, again, I don't, I don't think societies get rebuilt by someone telling everybody what to do in some grand scheme. I think societies get rebuilt and our society, unfortunately, is becoming more miserable, more depressed, more anxiety ridden, there's more suicide, there's more divorce. Those are all negatives. That the, the, the only way that I know of to begin to reverse that trend is to, is to do it on a, a, a person by person by person basis and then have it begin spilling over. And I think, this is, I think that's one of the things that we try to tackle in this book. We're doing it through the, through the form of, of going for marriage, but it will, it will make a person more of a giver, bigger, happier, more, you know, and that, that has a spillover into everything. And just, and what, what came out also as a result of that is I think that there's such a need for people to create gurus and for people to be gurus. And I think it's a beautiful opportunity to recognize that it's like, no, like this is information, but you ultimately have to take responsibility. And we're not here to, you know, take more of your money and have you spend more of our time. Like you got to take some ownership over this process yourself. Right. hundred percent. Right. Beautiful. Gentlemen, rabbis, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure connecting with you. I really thank appreciate so the time. Great. Thank you. Great wonderful. to be on with you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. There you have it, folks, another inspiring episode. If you enjoyed this, I ask you to please share this with your friends and to like us over on Rabbi Rupp through Facebook or on YouTube. And the more that we're able to get these important messages out, the more that we can really make an impact in the world. So I encourage you, please, to stay tuned. Uh, we have a ton of amazing speakers coming up and also to tell your friends about it. Thank you very much.